Flowchart, a poem by John Ashbery, part one. Still in the published city, but not yet overtaken by a new form of despair, I ask the diagram, is it the foretaste of pain it might easily be? Or an emptiness so sudden it leaves the girders wanging in the absence of wind, the sky milk blue and astringent? We know life is so busy, but a larger activity shrouds it, and this is something we can never feel, except occasionally in small signs put up to warn us and as soon expunged in part or wholly. Sad grows the river god as he oars past us downstream without our knowing him. For if he reasons he can be overlooked, then to know him would be to eat him ingest the name he carries through time to set down finally on a strand of rotted hulks. And those who sense something squeamish in his arrival know enough not to look up from the page they are reading, the plated lines that extend like a bronze chain into eternity. It seems I was reading something. I have forgotten the sense of it, or what the small role of the central poem made me want to feel, no matter. The words distant now and mitered glint, yet not one ever escapes the forest of agony and pleasure that keeps them in a solution that has become permanent through inertia. The force of meaning never extrudes. And the insects, of course, don't mind. I think it was at that moment he knowingly, and in my own interests, took back from me the slow-flowing idea of flight, now too firmly channeled, its omnipresent reminders etched too deeply into my forehead, its crass grievances and greetings a class apart from the wonders every man feels, whether alone in bed or with a lover, or beached with the shells on some atoll. And if solitude swallows us up at times, it is only later that the idea of its permanence sifts into view. Yea, later, and perhaps only occasionally, and only much later, stands from dawn to dusk, just as the plaintive sound of the harp of the waves is always there as a backdrop to conversation and conversion, even when most forgotten and cannot make sense of them, but he knows the familiar, unmistakable thing, and that gives him courage as day expires and evening marshals its hosts in preparation for the long night to come. And the horoscopes flung back all we had meant to keep there, our meaning for us, yet how different the sense when another speaks it. How cold the afterthought that takes us out of time for a few moments, just as we were beginning to go with the fragile pensions mother love taught us, and transports us to a stepping stone far out at sea. So, no matter what the restrictions, admonitions, premonitions that trellised us early supporting this artificial espalier thing we have become, By the same token, no subsequent learning shall deprive us, it seems. No holy sophistication loosen the bands of blessed decorum, our present salvation, our hope for years to come. Only let that river not beseech its banks too closely, upbraid and swamp its levees, for though the flood is always terrible, much worse are the painted monsters born later, out of the swift-flowing alluvial mud. And when the time for the breaking of the law is here, be sure it is to take place in the matrix of our everyday thoughts and fantasies, our wonderment at how we got from there to here. In the unlashed eye of noon, these and other terrible things are written, yet it seems at the time as mild as sowing of wavelets in a reservoir. Only the belated certainty comes to matter much, I suppose, and, when it does, comes to seem as immutable as roses. Meanwhile, a god has bungled it again. Early on was a time of seeming, golden eggs that hatched into regrets, a snowflake whose kiss burned like an enchanter's poison, yet it all seemed good in the growing dawn. 
the breeze that always nurtures us, no matter how dry, how filled with complaints about time and the weather, the air, pointed out a way that diverged from the true way without negating it, to arrive at the same results by different spells, so that no one was wiser for knowing the way we had grown almost unconsciously into a cube of grace that was to be a permanent shelter. Let the book end there, some few said, but that was of course impossible. The growth must persist into areas darkened and dangerous, undermined by the curse of that death breeze, until one is handed a skull as a birthday present, and each closing paragraph of the novella is underlined to be continued, that there should be no peace in the present, no sleep save in glimpses of the future on the crystal ball's thick, bubble-like surface. No you and me unless we are together. Only then does he mumble confused words of affection at us as the Barbary bleeds close against the frost, a scarlet innocence, confused miracle to us for what we have done to others and to ourselves. There is no parting. There is only the fading guaranteed by the label, which lasts forever. This much the gods divulged before they became too restless, too preoccupied with other cures to see into the sole fact the present allows, along with much ribbon, much icing, and pretended music. But we can't live with them in their day. The air, though pure, is too dense. And afterwards, when others come up and ask, what was it like, one is too amazed to behave to one is too amazed to behave strangely. The future is extinguished. The world's colored paths all lead to my mouth, and I drop humbled, eating from the red clay floor. And only then does inspiration come, late, yet never too late. It's possible, it's just possible, that the gods' claims fly out windows as soon as they are opened, are erased from the accounting. If one is alone, it matters less than to others embarked on a casual voyage into the promiscuity of dreams. Yet I am always the first to know how he feels. The inventory of the silent auction doesn't promise much. One chewed cactus, an air mattress, a verbatim report, sandals, the massive transcriptions with which he took unforgivable liberties. Hell, I'd sooner join the project farther ahead, retaining all benefits. But one is doomed repeating oneself, never to repeat oneself. You know what I mean? If in the interval false accounts have circulated, why, one is at least unaware of it and can live one's allotted arc of time in feasible unconsciousness, watching the linen dresses of girls with a wreath of smoke to come home to. There is nothing beside the familiar doormat to get excited about. Yet when one goes out in loose weather, the change is akin to choirs singing in a distance nebulous with fear and love. Sometimes one's own hopes are realized and life becomes a description of every second of the time it took. Conversely, some are put off by the sound of legions milling about. One cultivates certain smells, is afraid to leave the charmed circle of the anxious room, lest uncommitted atmosphere befall, and the oaks are seen to be girdled with ivy. A lackey said, what stressful sounds. More of him another time, but now you in the ivory frame have stripped yourself one by one of your earliest opinions polluted in any case by bees, and stand radiant in the circle of our lost unhappy youth. O oh, my friend, that knew me before I knew you, and when you came to me, knew it was forever, here there would be no break, only I was so ignorant I forgot what it was all about. You chided me for forgetting, and in an instant I remembered everything, the schoolhouse, the tent meeting, and I came closer until the day I wrote my name firmly on the ruled page. That was a time to come, and all happy crying in memory placed the stone in the magic box and covered it with wallpaper. 
It seemed our separate lives could continue separately for themselves and shine like a single star. I never knew such happiness. I never knew such happiness could exist. Not that the dark world was removed or brightened, but each thing in it was slightly enlarged, and in so seeming became its true cameo self, a liquid thing to be held in the hollow of the hand like a bird. More formal times would come, of course, but the abstract good sense would never drown in the elixir of this private sorrow that would always sing to itself in good times and bad, an example to one's consciousness, an emblem of correct behavior in darkness or underwater. How unshifting those secret times and how stealthily they grew. It was going to take forever just to get through the first act, yet the scenery, a square of medieval houses, gardens with huge blue and red flowers, and solemn birds that dwarfed the trees they sat on, need never have given way to the fumes and crevices of the high glen. The point is one was going to do to it what mattered to us, and all would be correct as in a painting that would never ache for a frame but dream on as nonchalantly as we did. Who could have expected a dream like this to go away, for there are some that are the web on which our waking life is painstakingly elaborated. There are real bustling things there, and the burgomaster of success stalks back and forth, directing everything with a small motion of a finger. But when it did come, the denouement, we were off drinking in some restaurant, too absorbed, too eternally expectantly happy to be there or care. That inspiration came later in sleep, while it rained urgently so that lines of darkness interfered with the careful arrangement of the dream's disguise. No takers? Anyway, sleep itself became this chasm of repeated words, of shifting banks of words, rising like steam out of some place into something. Forget the promises the stars made you. They were half stone, and besides, are twinned to no notion that can have an impact on our way of thinking, as crab now, as at any time in the past. A forlorn park stood before us, but there was no way to want to enter it, since the guards had abandoned their posts to slate gray daylight flowing into your heart as though it were a blotter, confounding or negating the rare survival of wit into our century. These, at any rate, are my children, she intoned, of whom I divest myself so as to fit into the notch of infinity as defined by a long arc of crows returning to the distant coppice. All's aglow. But we see by it that some mortal material was included in the glorious compound, that next to nothing can prevent its mudslide from sweeping over us while it renders the pitted earth smooth and pristine and something like one's original idea of it, only so primitive it can't understand us. Meanwhile, the coat I wear, woven of consumer products, asks you to pause and inspect the still fertile ground of our once valid compact with the ordinary and the true. It wants out, and we shall get it even with decreased services and an increased number of spot checks, since all of it, ourselves included, is in our own interest to speak up for and deny when the proper moment arrives. Now nothing further remains to be done except to sleep and pray, saving the pieces for a slightly later time, when they shall be recognized as holy remnants of the burnished mirror in which the Almighty once saw himself and wept, realizing how all his prophecies had come true for his people at last, and no one was any wiser for it 
as they walked the wide, shadowless streets with no eyelids or memory when it came to intersecting the itineraries of other similarly blessed creatures. Blessed for having no name, no preconceived strategies, unless they lay underground too unprofitable to dig up until the requisite technologies had been developed some decades down the road, and nodding as though in acknowledgement of an acquaintance one doesn't remember, yet is not sure of having ever formally renounced either. Was it on land or at sea that that bird first came to one, many miles from the nearest anything? What we are to each other is both less urgent and more perturbing, having no discernible root, no raison d'etre, or else flowing backward into an origin like the primordial soup it's so easy to pin anything on, like a carnation to one's lapel. So it seems we must stay in an uneasy relationship, not quite hitting together, not precisely friends or lovers, though certainly not enemies. If the buoyancy of the spongy terrain on which we exist is to be experienced as an ichor, not a commentary on all that is missing from the reflection in the mirror. Did I say that? Can this be me? Otherwise the treaty will seem premature, the peace unearned and one might as well slink back into the solitude of the kennel for the blunder to be read as anything but willful self-indulgent. And meanwhile, everything around us is already prepared for this resolution. The temperature, the season are exactly right for it all not to be awash with sentiments expelled from some impossibly distant situation some episode from your childhood nobody knows about, and even you can't remember accurately. It is time for the long beds, then, and the extra hours to be spent in them. But surely somebody can find something spontaneous to say before it all fizzles, before the incandescent tongs are slaked in mud and the tender yellow shoots of the willow dry up instead of maturing, having concluded that the moment is inappropriate, the heroes gone to their rest. And all the plain folk of history foundered in the subjective reading of their lives as expendable, the stuff of ordinary heresy, shards of common crockery, interesting only because unearthed long after the time had come for a decision on what to do at the very moment they disappeared into timelessness. One of innumerable such tramping exits that no one hears so long as they may be promptly and justly forgotten, subtracted like the soul we never knew we had, and replaced with something young, and easier, climate of any day and of all the days, post-millenarian. Just so, some argue, some are still nurtured by their innocence, a wanton formula a nursemaid gives them. They grow up to be slim and tall, but often it seems something is lacking, some point of concentration around which a person can collect itself and be neither conscious nor uncaring, be neutral. And when the pitcher is emptied of milk, it is not refilled, but washed and put away on a shelf. Conversations are still initiated haltingly under the leaves around an outdoor table, but they insist on nothing and are remembered only as disquieting examples of how life might be in that other halting yet prosperous time when games of strength were put away. And each guest rises abruptly from the table, a star at his or her shoulder. 
For then, in smeared night, no blotch or defect can erase it. The wonderful greeting you heard in the morning and heard yourself reply to. But at times such as these late ones, a moaning in copper beaches is heard of regret, not for what happened, or even for what could conceivably have happened, but for what never happened, and which therefore exists as dark and transparent as a dream, a dream from nowhere, a dream with no place to go, all dressed up with no place to go, that an axe menaces off and on throughout eternity. Or ships, lands which no one sees, islands scattered like pebbles across the immense surface of the ocean. This is what it is to believe and not see, to implore dreaming, then to arrive home by cunning, stricken and exhausted, a framed picture of oneself. The ads didn't tell you this. They were too busy with their own professional sleight of hand to notice those farther out in deep water. When such a destined wretch as I washed headlong from on board, decorating the maelstrom with someone's, I wish I knew whose, notion of what is right or cute. Soon the dark chairs and tables stand out sharply in front of strange green-striped walls. Gulls circle in the sky. Smoke from piles of old tires set alight at strategic points throughout the city sifts through the crack where the pane doesn't quite join the sill. Is this, I ask you, a mute entreaty on the part of some well-intentioned but shy deity meant to take the temperature of the lives being squandered by the few left here below? Ask, rather, why the clock slows down a little more each day, necessitating double, triple, and even quadruple tintinabulations in order for its fundamentally banal intentions to be elucidated so that one may settle down to enjoying the usufruct of the sparse, shattering seconds, the while looking forward to retiring at 90 on a comfortable income without ruining the day one first took up the odd gambit that has projected us into a lifetime of self-loathing and shallow interests. One lives thus, plucking a mean sort of living from the rubbish heaps of history, unaware that the parallel daintiness of the lives of the rich, like fish in an ocean whose bottom is dotted with the rusted engines and debris of long-forgotten wrecks, unfolds, yes. And I, in greater depths than he, I suppose, Yet it doesn't help deliver one back, either to the after-all sane and helpful blank square one is always setting out from, having in the meantime forgotten those other precepts, sane and insane, that intrude as soon as one begins to think about anything at all. It's always on the rim of some flesh pot briefly mentioned in the Bible one is seen to squirm, a pinned worm so that one is pitted against others as against oneself. Lonesome, hungry, and a little bit thirsty, until the day of doom, universally misconstrued as a time of relief and pillars of dust rising straight up out of the desert valleys where one's feet take one. And all that mythology of broken tracks, jettisoned equipment, and the long, uninhabited wadi, whose watering trough is merely mud now, 
and a few puddles of camel stale materializes. Latest reports show that the government still controls everything, but that the location of the blonde captive has been pinpointed thanks to urgent needling from the backwoods constituency. And the population in general is alive and well. But can we dwell on any of it? Our privacy ends where the clouds begins, just here, just at this bit of anonymity on the seashore. And we have the right to be confirmed, just as animals or even plants do, provided we go away and leave every essential piece of the architecture of us behind. Surely then, what we work for must be met, with approval sometimes even though we haven't the right to issue any such thing. There are caves and caves, and almost none of them has been explored yet. That doesn't give us much to go on, yet we insistently cry that someone else's rondo is already being played, and that over and over, so how come nobody does anything about it, relaxes us in our shoes and tells us about bedtime? Surely in my younger days, people acted differently about it. There was no barnstorming, just quiet people going about their business and not worrying too much about being rewarded at the end when it came down to that. No, we were wandering away, too busy for such things, toward the altar, or better yet, into the nave whose fruit and flower decoration led unostentatiously and facilely into the outdoors it anticipated. No use just sitting around juicing the lemon, or the orange for that matter, as long as one was intending to get up and play again. And now that the time of reckoning nears, it wears a changed coat. Its color is brighter. No, but there must be some structural difference as well in the ordering of the colors and how they were laid on. Only no one can conceivably care about this to talk about it. Well, I do and can, but the unnice fractions almost always assert themselves above the din of this great city, and I have trouble remembering even my name until some passing girl kindles its fancy, what my name was to me when I first began to think about other things. There is no postage for this boredom, either really so that it keeps returning. It might be said never to have gone away at all, except for the media with which it keeps getting compared. I say the other reaches really tickle you when you have a chance. And all this time I thought he was only farting around, disinclined to have a serious opinion on anything, and even more so to give it vent or utterance. And my sight clears for the first time in a thousand years, and it's true. I can see up ahead, where no one waits, and the long flags flap and droop in the dust of sunsets. And so it may be forever and ever till we get it right. Mine isn't the option to show you how to escape or comfort you unduly, but with a little time and a little patience, we shall make this thing work. Even though you thought everything you touched was doomed to fall apart or not start, time has a few surprises up its sleeve and deserves to be spat on for not having more or would if it didn't. Yet it does. There are promises clad with the finest silk you can imagine and silver ornaments hitherto undreamed of. If only you can match them with something of equal loveliness and curiosity from your own secret collection. And of course this does take time, but in the end, one senses it more richly bedizened than ever before. And in line from promotion, out of the ranks of futility into the narrow furrows of bliss and total sublimity, crystallized in good humor that took over early on in the century. Of course, no one is aware of this, yet. But give everybody time, even no shows, and it will all flow backwards, that caparisoned night, a trial for some, and otherwise it all gets out into your childhood and the beach that was its launching pad before hunger and fears took over even as delight fostered the notion that there was going to be enough for everybody. For children to pause and have a happy home no one talks about anymore. Best to rest, sleep, and laugh about it, someone who no longer matters, and then you'll find that you are indeed in it and have been all along 
only that the show was on a kind of treadmill moving at the same leaden pace as your jokes and ambitions, which is why you never knew about it and therefore consented to come along anyway, on this dangerous outing to the very sources of time. Don't excuse yourself. Nothing could. I've never really considered telling you, and now. He hated doing it. He wasn't sure why. And so just as the mirthless sequel was being disinterred, a feeling of rage came over him, but also of relief, because you couldn't do it now. They are lost somewhere out there between the trees and muck, besides all cars have them now, and the colorful glasses and telephones are there. He came for a fitting. It was proper and it is time. But no matter what you do, someone will be malevolent about it and try to stop you, though there is no stopping them. He came for the fitting and tried it on and it fit just like that. What a laugh. Oh yes, she laughed out out of the closet. I'll be there in a minute, dear. You see how fond of him she was? And he, well, he just took it, like most things. Change. Pretzels. And she thought he was so good at it, it kind of faked her when the last windshield whizzed by and it was all over as though in a rush. And as meat is sung and lips only slowly parted for the alphabet of night chimes to come clanging down like an immense ring of keys, so with the gale-whipped morsel notion of itself, it dogs us and all humans, and we never quite get out from under it. There is always a thread of it attached to you, and when you remove that, another one, as though magnetized, takes its place. Begora, it was dumb to be in the pit with him, for then the sentence. But who knows what all they may have tried before, what avenues exhausted before it was time to mend and really be the interloper, and for all its sparks, it was never considered dangerous. Everybody gets such ideas on occasion, but here was the little shot glass of night, all ready to drink, and you spread out in it even before it radiates in you. It doesn't matter whether or not you like striations, because in the time it takes to consider them, they will have merged. The rich man's house become a kettle, the wreath in the sink turn to something else, and still the potion holds prominent. And you want to see it and to have it be talked about this way, not drool, aimless, compassion. So on that night, we were almost boarded up, packed off to a vacation. Where? Moreover, no men heard of it, only teenage girls and male adolescents with fruited complexions and scalps, who were going to make it difficult for one should an occasion arise. But a funny thing happened. None of us were around to count all incommensurate with our duties as we should forever be, and not wanting much training. The dark was like nectar that evening, rising in the mouth. You thought you had never heard so pretty a sound. Then, of course, quietism was again broached, and that soon, and quite soon, the pink of the salmon ignited the way of the plover's egg and the black of old scarred metal. Then how it feels relaxes one like a warm, numbing bath, and her argument, and yours, and all of theirs, why, why not just consider, or better yet, just hold, hold on to them. For the speed of light is far away, and you, sooner or later, must return to a deteriorated situation, and placing your hand in the fire, say just what it means to you to be connected, and over, and kiss the burning edges of the unfolded stiff card and be able to avoid doing anything about it or acknowledging it when we have passed, when all is past. And why did he, by what was he it? Why we push our little tails around and back and forth and so on, by which time it literally implodes. I mean, by then he was settling in and no one called his attention to it. And your repertory of groans is one glottal one. You'll feel the difference. And if it can't liberate itself from us, just turn to dust in the air floating with the kind of negative majesty 
one thought one not see again in one's life. But I had the horn. We had a deal we agreed on. Yet no record of its existence is sketched. And I am all I am in the meanwhile and 13,000 fucking miles away like a planter on his porch. And so I am unaware of the flambeau and possibly the stealth that brought me here and abandoned me. I, I'm awfully sorry, big boy, but my plans concern George and his wife over by the other side of the lake slipping into a nervous breakdown. And I, we, well, as you know, we sit here determined, not like the rind of the melon, but not liking to say anything about it into the miraculous dawn that gasp gathers us into its stalking. A pervasive air about him of studious lyricism avoided us, and he turned ever so quickly to the hen house, and off in the open was seen running, and then, it's so easy, was probably not recorded except between the trees of a clearing. And who, what patron saint, will pick up the pieces of the glittering lighthouse and restore us to them in a kind of Roman calm that we were meant for? And suddenly, shit! It's the fire and glass breaking everywhere. It's as though you were never born, but you must somehow drink a toast to the small nucleus of watch springs or confusion that lords it over you now, but will be less than an un unconsumed coal among ashes, soon until the dryer's fixed. And then, all out and along the cinder path that led so alluringly down to the bayou, all we can know is hope and fevers for a coming tomorrow of saffron and moist rage under the corner of someone's hat that wasn't meant to like you. Me, I rest in the sun regardless. We saw a car drive onto the city that is the password. Ice cubes played tag up and down my spine. I'm here to collect the reward. Obey my every command, no matter how strange it may seem. Otherwise, we'll have been banished before the judgment, not know how fortunate we were in our old simplicity. Other vanished sinews were interviewed, and nobody had anything good or bad to say about us, which doesn't cause any tears, yet one wonders, what if one were back there again? On whom might one rely what distractions would be concocted for us if we had strayed? And who is the baron that manipulates our daily lives from afar? Why even depend on industry and innocence when rebellion is growing in the ditch just outside? Who knows about us? Whoever did? Weren't we lying to ourselves when we thought we caught someone being just slightly interested in us one day? And if so, whose fault is it? That we came too late to an overgrown baseball diamond, and in the meantime shacks had vanished without a trace from the face of the globe, and now the evening star was combing her hair at the attic window, and no one is to blame. Just be calm. Don't rush. It's all over, or soon will be, or just was, in any other language sufficient to tell it in, just like it was. It has long been my contention that jackals, unlike other denizens of the epistemic forest, are able to predict the future of metabolizing some kind of parasite that grows on other people's children and devours them. The eyes are a profound cobalt blue, accepting of moral dilemmas and sprouting proverbs, slowly, like crystals, but no, not innocent, and not lacking in character. Twenty years ago, you will recall, the eyes thought they made a difference, were glazed, forgetting, and impotent, relieved of parenting. Arenas were quite happy to comply, though a little bewildered, at first at least. One very chewy advanced proposition seemed to falter, then faded into the background noise. But here's the thing, continued to this day, bald and bleeding, I don't like it. No one is obliged to. Everyone may, bon gré, mal gré, ignore it. Yet it peaks, and in doing so has its say. 
The manageress was adamant, but I had the horrible idea of prolonging beyond night and dawn one's predilection for quoting old dispatches and getting into hot water. And then? The sullen bathroom question lasted. I was too far out into it, out of pocket, plus the by no means negligible question of my comfort to be decoded, and all other arguments suddenly collapsed like a dream of homecoming. How stung my myth. My dream wasn't over. We were only such a dream. By this time, all the caissons of power had been turned inside out anyway. It was considered correct to spice it, and rightly so. But how often can one shamble back to the vegetable gunk and still retain at least a superficial appearance of contrition? As often as the clock seems to say I love you and boulders turn in their sleep and sigh and the cat is forever running away. It took two weeks to lead up to this. The stores are quiet now. I say lie down in it. I already asked Santa about it. And then, you see, it became part of our cultural history. We can't ignore it even though we'd like to. It's so mild and hurtless. And you thought you had it bad or good. With as many associations as that to keep thumbing through, one winks at the legal filigrane that penetrates every page of the moldering sheaf down to the last one, like a spike through a door. Somebody dusts these ashes off, open the curtains, get a little light on the subject, the subject going off on its own again. Yes, but if home were only light sliding down darkened windows and rivulets, inhabiting their concavities and generally adapting itself to the contours of what is already there. One could understand that, lie back on the stiff daybed shading one's eyes from omnipresent, bleary dawn that acts as an uncle's remonstrance. Do this not for me or for yourself, but for your mother, the way an empty circle of daisies seeks to promote plausibility and is simultaneously too distraught and ashamed to articulate the siren call crisply and sinks it too, into the foam of reliably not taking itself seriously. I wish you well, darling, always, especially days when the gray pain lifts for a moment, like fog trapped under a layer of warmer air, then sags definitely not knowing what to do with itself or about anything. Days when the pointed freshness of forests above the snow line can consider itself numb, when the friendly gurgling of rills talks back and one listens but never heeds that desire for perfectibility. Hey, it was here only a moment ago. I think, or somebody misled me, as sometimes happens. Yet, with as many associations as that, some of it is bound to come down, to crumble, to be reduced to a vexing powder, but natural like dust, and that within all our lifetimes. Local businessmen bristled. New painless methods were introduced, but somehow made it all thick and rubbery, an unwanted anthem. No one said it. Care was off and running, the divorce courts overflowing for once, and no one was going to take issue, dispute the power vacuum that was walking around shaking hands, acting for all the world like a candidate. But you feel it, don't you? How come nobody has anything nice to say? I mean you, striped ball, even for a testimonial dinner on a commercial. Then they all run back. Must have been a mistake. Yes, we have it here. Anyway, where are they? I am violently opposed to the little pieces of the puzzle getting in on the act, slobbering, as it were, any more than I can see Little Red Riding Hood climbing Mount McKinley. But as for the horror of it, we are, look, all of us undisciplined. So when it's time to take the kids somewhere or subvert the boss's ego, the light goes out of us for an instant. Oh, I know we can patch it up always successfully later, but out of the fine deposit of the encounter, there is surely something that is required reading, though seldom in focus. Good gravy, it gives me the creeps just telling you about it. And after we had sunbathed, the mist was on time, dull and fathomable. That's no reason to return home, to our roots, of course, yet neither can it be construed as an invitation. 
You see, everything you see on television is a fraud, is planted there to confuse distraught patriots like yourself. And though we enter into it no wiser and leave resolved to mend our ways, something like an actual misprint occurs. We are no longer in charge of our propriety. Jackdaws have launched nearby and the elms have seen better days. Why is it that just because I am a child I can warn no one of this except by speaking in tongues? Oh, I know formulating bright, snazzy, fabulous demands isn't the same as being a teacher and picking up on the slowness of your student. I can rhapsodize about that, too, but there comes a point when having aimed accurately and reaped the reasonable rewards is more than something to sing about. Is the entity, no, I mean the accretion, is indeed the fantastic fact. It was like being run over when I first thought of this. And now, sad to say, our limbs aren't as important. We have witnessed an entire tennis match and candles are coming on. There's a hint of fall in the air, soggy and bored. Oh, I have to keep fighting back to find you. And then when you're still here, what is it I know? Nothing about the future, and no more about you either, honey, I was going to say. Have you noted how things have a way of working out, but have you also noted how rarely this constitutes a satisfying set of circumstances, especially when we dream, not plan them? In my house, no one is rude, but that's no excuse. I think footfalls are approaching, circling round, then moving away to some other sun, some direction. I care more, yet it's there. Despite handicaps, trading continues. Natural horns bleat. The fog may be messing up traffic today, but an office's chic outfit signal that for sure violence too has its calm aspects when things get done in dozens or even scores. The museum guards must have known something was up, yet here too only silent, silent stammers. Don't ask your partner what to think. He may have noticed that the weather vane is jammed even as a crowd of day trippers move on out of the city in gut gaily painted cars, and by noon something just too awful had come between us. I called John, but he couldn't come to the phone, nor did his assistant have any clue as to what the barking, the clatter of falling jewelry, were all about. It occurs to me in my home on the beach sometimes that others must have experiences identical to mine and are also unable to speak of them, that if we cared enough to go into each other's psyche and explore around, some of the canned white entrepreneurial brain food could be reproduced in time to save the legions of the dispossessed and elephants. But what is a waiting room for, after all? if not to live out one's life scarily to the borders of altered lawns with red leaves nestled on them. Home becomes more than a place, more more even than a concept for this elite minority, and then singles them out by pointing so that some symbol of their shame never goes away until the paper it is written on has rotted over thousands of years, by which time new insects will have been introduced, new forms of dandruff, holes that are really shoes, a thin puddle of air rules over us. All obeisances are made that way. All curtsies and notions seem to point into that vortex of fear just as the alarm goes off. But is it fear or only an unpleasant hum? And jaywalkers gravitate there, are seen to believe. The old man had no enemies. Why then? Because a handful of ages knew of his connection to poetry via the wet, fissured rocks far below in the cave and took revenge for their own knowingness to create an unpleasant situation that would probably have gone away if nobody had said anything about it. But now, well, you just can't ask people to keep silent about something they've seen, and the forces that prodded us onto victory are staging an uncharacteristic fast. Only the intrusion of tomorrow's light will have been recognized as a new note in the negotiations, which will in any case by that time be in the public domain, and no further recruiting be deemed necessary or undertaken. I can't shake the hunch that this is what the stuff is all about, 
and no one cares to know, let alone be a witness to further legal horse trading. That's what caused all the trouble. Words, however, are not the culprit. They are at worst a placebo leading nowhere. Though nowhere, it must be added, can sometimes be a cozy place, preferable in many cases to somewhere. To banal, if agree agreeable note spitting, covering reams of fool's cap with them won't guarantee success. Yet neither will it automatically induce ruination, wheel on the guillotine, leave in the middle distance, something like an endless morgue, a lake of regret. It's better, though, to listen to the strange chirps of the furniture. Listening is a patented device whose manifold uses have scarcely begun to be explored, that one should practice on as many occasions are deemed profitable. Bore your friends, wind them, show them a grand time. Other more auspicious occasions are sure to be evoked. Nights when, from the grandstand, tremendous plumes of steam plummeted straight into the basalt sky. Days of conversion, and at the end, a feeling of progress in sorting out mutual feelings and actually partly resolving certain discords came to seem as though it were happening, and the treehouse was split apart by rays plunging out of the incandescent core of tangled concerns and resolves, and the hand car of an important relationship was steered onto the right track out of the city into a shadowed, mostly empty peripheral zone of tears for anointed and angry memories diffused now. Now, ready for twilight. It's something Eagle Scouts used to discuss by the campfire, a page that somehow got ripped out of the record to be as though it had never been. Just because cows and horses stand around as much as they always have, it is as though we were contemplating a set of sealed instructions. Now the bridge will never be built. If that is all time had in the wallet at his back, scaled down surprises here and there, a puttering about in the dust, and once again it seems as though it were all up to us. Well, why not? The gravel is underfoot is a little finer this time round, and nobody yells at you. The words have, as they always do, come full circle, dragging the meaning that was on the reverse side all along, and what even expects this something to chew on? I'm rubber and you're glue. Whatever you say bounces off me and sticks to you, in which gluey embrace I surrender. We are both part of a living thing now. A decade later, he stumbled or became confused. There was no one else among the, um, along on this outing, so why was he always flailing his arms majestically, talking to the walls? Whenever someone cross over to be kind to him, it was as though he'd never seen a human face before. The eyes were runny, the nose ditto. The words were like chopped cotton wool after he'd forced them out. To drag meaning like this behind one is bad enough, but to have it beside one is worse, worse than knowing what to do. Finally, the memory became an object to be passed around for displays of connoisseurship to ignite Thus, one can live in the same house with one's ambitions and drives and still have the luxury of feeling alone. Oh, come off it. No one wants to be alone. And even you know, accept the occasional invitation, but also slog on, unshod, solitary, except for casual greetings from even more casual acquaintances. Harder to explain is the disparity between what is loved and the energy with which one goes about doing it, and harder still to understand or appreciate the astonishingly thin gruel which serves its hunger de tous les jours, and with which it gives every appearance of being satisfied. I suppose if one were born and grew up on a desert island, knowing of nothing better or even different, one might coincide with the four walls that contain one and see no anomaly, no grotesquerie in the result. This mound of cold ashes that we call, for want of a better word, the past, wouldn't inflect the horizon as it does here calling attention to shapes that resemble it, and so liberating them into the bloodstream of our collective memory. Here a chicken coop, there a smokestack, farther on an underground laboratory. 
These things then wouldn't depress or, as sometimes happens, exalt one, and living would just be that, a heavenly apothem leading to a trance on earth. Yet one scolds the horizon for having nothing better to offer. Did I order that? And when the bill comes, tries to complain to the management, but at that point the jig or whatever is up. Yes, I've seen many fine young girls in my time take that path and wonder afterwards what went wrong. I've seen children taken from their homes at too early an age, left to wander about like little Nell, not knowing that they were never obliged to do this thing. Oh, paradise, to lie in the hammock with one's book and drink, not hearing the murmur of consternation as it moves progressively up the decibel scale. Yet I see you are uncertain where to locate me. Here I am, and I've done more thinking about you than perhaps you realize. Yes, a slight more than you've done about me. Which reminds me, when are we going to get together? I mean, really, not just for a drink and a smoke, but really invade each other's privacy in a significant way that will make sense and later amends to both of us for having done so. For I am short of the mark despite my bluster and my swaggering, have no real home and no one to inhabit it except you, who I am in danger of losing permanently as a blue fish slips off the deck of a ship, as a tuna flounders. But say, you know all that. What kind of a chump do you think I am, anyway? I would like your attention, not just your eyes and face. I would like to tell you how much I love you. I'm a sap for trying. But down deep in the bowels of the ship, we hear something, don't you agree? That tells us where we went off course and what we must do to get back on it. Only now it's too late. All the spars have erupted like apple blossoms hitting the reef. I would like to go on for a while anyway, but wonder under the circumstances whether it wouldn't be like setting out on a long journey in rain so heavy it takes your breath away. Even one step is out of the question, I think now. I no longer have the energy to breathe on the window panes that the frost will transform it into garlands of chiseled steel that draw one out like a wrapped interlocutrix. No, it's heavy out here today. The wind serves only to remind one of other possible beginnings and an end, if one were likely to pass this way again. I see. I'll try another ticket. Meanwhile, thanks for the harmonium. Its inoffensive chords swept me right off my feet near the railroad, and nice are returning to bloom tomorrow and each day after that. I thought nobody needed a confessor anymore, but I was wrong, I guess. So, old stump, I'm off till tomorrow or some early day next week. I mean, how much more can I say, giving myself away without negating the positive meaning of what I wanted to say, and which has now subtly changed back to an elementary precept or something else one doesn't want much want to hear? How we flowered and lost and rose up thin again with our thoughts to distract us, but not too much, and so approached the shambling roadbed and placed one soul in front of another, slowly but not tentatively, and then the lean-to, the buttercups, and the ring of blue mountains hove into view as though to say, but that's what I asked you last time, and now you will be forced to give a different answer, even though the wind has dropped. I thought I saw someone over there. No, it's just the wind egging the trees on into the battle with dusk, and I can still see how it's still you there, only with such a difference I almost didn't have time to trust my space. But we know now and have had it true to be us for the asking, for the begging, for just one more time. In winter, it was generally a slow blizzard of piano rags, while in summer or some such season, gentian shadows on the tapioca fields looked themselves good enough to eat, and always in a locker downstairs was this pocket mirror with the thumbprint on it, a source of shame. But how can I deny my true origin and nature, even if it's going to get me into a lot of trouble later? At any rate, No notice was taken of anything, and maids pushed their prams, and policemen stopped cars, and it was getting to be spring, or it wasn't, but the bare trees looked oddly barbed, and perhaps that was something, and it seemed to be starting to rain. 
I sit here wringing my hands, but what good does it do if I am the ghost this time, despite the reassuring activity that surrounds me? And if I am to be cast off, then where? There has to be a space, even a negative one, a slot for me, or does there? But if all space is contained within me, then there is no place for me to go. I am not even here, and now can join no choir or club. Indeed, I am the sawdust of what's around, but nobody can even authorize that either. My collected letters, will I somehow feel vindicate me? But even there, the onion skin cannot be split and I'll go on being a postscript written in invisible ink until some day, several centuries from now, when they open a time capsule and the enthusiastic fresh air will rush out to inform the world and one can rise up from one's nap in time for bed. The great apartment fronts will be put their heads together and sunset will seem an enormous conflagration, but vindicate one at what price. Where are the children now? Who wanted to hear that story. Why, the youngest of them passed away years ago, on the west coast surprised that anyone should remember, and the slow torrent of the glacier got piped in efficiently to fill the slightest hairline fissure. Its job is done. We all live in the past now. And so the children must still hang on somewhere, though no one is quite sure where or how many or what paths there are to be taken in darkness. Only the fools, the severed heads, know. So, my old mother became a niche in time, and she, too, preferred not to get out of it. As long as it was going to be, it wasn't this bad, says the antique adage. And these three or four others came of it. No one asked them in, but they came in anyway, prepared to play. And somehow a chapter was written about this. It all boils down to keeping quiet and having a good time as long as you don't abuse the orange trees standing in their pots so civil. We'll all be with Will with Nick, yours next time, too, and let's hear it for those who never won anything, whose time came and went, like the tide leaving curious bones behind, and they were never cheated on and never lied without telling anyone the truth. And behind these interlopers and more interlopers, a vast frame of them, too facile to be derided, and bananas stand around stiffly in it at attention. Is this the gray way I once knew? And if so, where are the standard bearers? Why have our values been lost? Who is going to pay for any of this? Potsil is too small for a man of your caliber. Full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its fragrance on the arctic air outside the shady octopus saloon, and then some. If all is going to be reorganized, the charming irregularities of the days ahead may as well go too. The song of plaintive songs choke off the ingress while alleviating the drip, as the old man, hypotenuse-like, touches an extremity that soon burns out of control, surrounds the town on the down, and all rush together, those who hated each other suddenly finding good reason for the slobbering embrace. Whether it's more fun to feel in one's own underpants or strike out on the high road to professional success, all pavilions aflutter, all portholes glinting, before the thing sinks in the mouth of the river, memory has been transformed into corpses, and while we stand discussing the news, the unmanageable outline of something much bigger and more profuse is struggling to understand itself. It will be years before it gets around to us, and by then what faces will we be? Who's going to take care of the association headquarters, and likelier still, revert with us to the narrow-gauge railroad track that steals through yellow viburnum and buried cinders as though to point the finger of guilt at the very beginning, the origin that is still a baby, learning to cry as the lights are blown out and darkness like a swift film of oil closes down to the brilliant crack at the horizon's outcome. No two employees know it. I thought, and this much remained hidden from me, the beloved canker that was always there, willing to give you all of Queen Mab for a quarter or turn on the rusty heel of one boot and be off, whistling into such nether parts of the sky as are deemed scarcely fit for consumption here on our poor earth. The Christmas lights, each blinking in the triumph of its individual color, 
toward the benefit of the whole. The stars and so on brought forth each night as a sop to the unweeded intellect, though much more remains to be read into them. Polar bears, relaxing each on his flow in the arctic section of the zoo or rolling off into the green, greasy water. People with pencils in their hands. A selection of erotic attractions for this week, including stiletto heels and rubber miniskirts. Carloads of whatever thundered past in the night. Juleps on porches. And the most extravagant collection of whodunit compliments one was ever gifted with, out of the nightfall of a dream, free-flowing as the meanders of a great stream, and every bit as meaningless and ominous. And finally, a choice of purgations, each not necessarily appropriate to the instance, i.e. electrocution for the theft of a needle, simple tears for aggravated manslaughter, a necklace of boar's teeth for blaspheming, added lines in the forehead for poaching or preaching, a fountain of mud on the front lawn of one who fondled his daughter's best friend's breasts, and, for the discreetly ambitious, a monotonous horizon. As it all bore in on me, I started to awake, then thought better of it, then rushed to the phone to call my broker, but it was too late. An oscillate of meaning in the lizard's tail of eternity had clicked into place, become pure and unattainable, while I, goof that I am, simultaneously realized just how sensational it was and how a fortune could be made by being first with a revelation as the bank closed its doors and the market suspended operations. True, they managed to save Hitler's brain before it destroyed the world with Zuppa Inglese. Just look in the milk can and you'll find out why. But sometimes, walking away from a cure may not be the best way to get rid of it. Sure, you feel fine. Today, and tomorrow as well. By next week, you're feeling better than you have in a long time. And as the medication gradually dissipates, the feeling of well-being takes over, an arbiter for generations to come. Only long after your death will the life you so busily led be imputed to the cornerstone of rot that was the secret driving force in it, something everyone at the time found to be okay. And as gravel sinks slowly with the aquifer's depletion, those not in the know will begin to stir in their sleep. It will gradually dawn on them, in dreams of cheese, toasted mostly, how the ingenious theory was flawed. Indeed, it was flaws that produced the dazzling quicksilver sheen that attracted so many to it for so long. If that's the case, why tarry on rutted goat paths from whence even the nearest foothills are shrouded by mist from view? The animals are incredible. There's even a dog named Bruce. One can retool the context, but slowly, slowly, and of course there is no positive guarantee of a successful outcome. One should think of it as a virtuoso spinning song whose relentless roulades promise minor disturbances among the cobwebbed rafters, but perhaps nothing much to weave one-armed nightshirts with for the wild swans, your brothers. Only... Try to forget the slow upward path to perfectness and let its mirror image come to install its truly sensitive surface within you during the night of deaf dreams and bad brushes with dolor. Fear of the dark causes it, but by then, to have been around and been of it will have carried over into lunch. Do you think there's some connection between this and that which happened before? Perhaps not. Perhaps there is none. But the Patagonians will like it, all 499,500 of them. Without further ado, bring on the subject of these negotiations. They all would like to collect it always, but since that's impossible, the Logos alone will have to suffice. A pity, since no one has seen it recently. Others crowded the opening, hoping to catch a glimpse but the majority saw the occluded expatriate ragtag representation and decided to not even try. To this day, no one knows the shape or heft of the thing, and that's the honest truth thrown out of court, exhibiting abrasions, muffled, and the story of how we ran out of it. So, marrying little with less, meliora probant, deteriora sequuntur, they foot drag in oblivion, lingering over stakes to analyze the latest inquiry. My biological father thought enough of it to see that I was posited, 
demanding names omitted from the roster, either from carelessness or intent to harm. We'll see that the thing gets done. And moreover, as I was asking her about her car, a quiet moment of fatigue slipped in, leaving faces drained, moments of pleasure unexamined. It was all because I told him he should change his shirt. He got mad and went out, and I didn't see him again for 30 years, by which time both of us had aged considerably, but were still reasonably attractive. Some might even say more so. I reminded him of the shirt thing, and he just laughed, said supermarkets sell them now, and besides, you shouldn't worry about a little dirt. It's the spice of life, he said. And we had set aside Siberia for us and for a few beloved friends, but the bureaucracy and the logistics of it all defeated us. Why, we were tied up in red tape for two and a half years, and after that, I just wanted out. No place is worth that much worry. Besides, it's quite quiet and confusing at home, thank you very much. Yet, I was still hung up on his idea of me. I thought I was becoming that person I didn't even know or want to know very much about. And all of my deja vus were ones that could have occurred to him. Still, life is reasonably absorbing, and there's a lot of nice people around. Most days are well-fed and relaxing, and one can improve one's mind a little by going out to a film or having a chat with that special friend. And before you know it, it's time to brush your teeth and go to bed. Why, then, does that feeling of emptiness keep turning up like a stranger you've seen dozens of times, out of focus usually, standing toward the rear of the bus or fishing for coins at the newsstand? I'm sure it's all coincidence, but it does have a way of rattling things like a constant draft through the house, rustling papers, riveting one's eye on the clock. So what's to feel nervous about? We all know that we have to live for a certain time, and then unfortunately we must die. And after that, no one is sure what happens. Accounts vary. But we, most of us, feel we'll be made comfortable for much of the time after that, and get credit for the admittedly few nice things we did, and no one is going to make too much of a fuss over those we'd rather draw the curtain over. And besides, we can't see much that was wrong in them. There are two sides to every question. Yet the facts fascinate one. We become one of those persons who are only satisfied with thoroughly reliable information, the truth, if there ever could be such a thing. Our journey flows past us like ice chunks. Maybe it is we that are stationary. Oh, so much God to police everything and still be left over to flatter one's harmless idiosyncrasies, the things that make us us, which is precisely what is fading like paint on a sign, no matter how much one pretends it's the same as yesterday. And children talk to us. That, surely, must be a plus. It's the lunatic frequency this time. One man taking his kids to the ball game reverted and was found playing cards at a friend's house. In spring, the tips of the apple branches grazed the trailers, and it's time for a new round robin of progressive delicacies and return thank you letters. Out in the open by the gym, it was never given a question to keep your pants on. We're all getting someplace, getting to be someone. Those are perspectives too limb to shoot along, and the people thank the baseball player who invented them. Inactivity is as a syrup to these people, some of them. They bank on mistrust and in the end are amazed to find their land has been overgrazed by herds of yak, each of the quadrupeds spaced almost equidistant from its nearest neighbor, as far as the eye can see, to Labrador and beyond into the topaz twilight of the Urals. Oh, some will say you can't trust them, let alone see them coming, let alone avoid a collision with drawing implications for the future of humanity. Even its garish exterior isn't as uncompromised as one might at first conclude, and then they have ashtrays and can see no one makes extraordinary demands on them as long as they go on living, and in April that doesn't seem an impossible feat. To those residing on the outskirts of some city or suburb, it gets to be even more of a tease. Were they included in the survey, and if so, who are they? Shooting gallery ducks waiting to be flattened, probably. What if one crosses the sea to descend at the pier where one's sweetheart bade farewell to one several years ago and finds her there to greet one? Not all that changed. And if the parents of both parties pronounce it a suitable match, 
Why, there you are. Another union has been consecrated. Another two people have been driven from loneliness into the reciprocal dawn of each other's arms, as if it were long ago, and tidings spread throughout the land, and ordinary people came to appreciate and savor and go back into the narrow, closet-like conundrum of their own slender existences, and be thankful there was for once something to talk about, and then mutually agree on. A pact with the forces at be, nothing less, and that is saying a good deal. So in all eras, bargains have been struck, horns blown in some strange, silly way, each of us, and is the stronger for it. We made our tea, and then we drank it. This is an honorable instance of how shame can disappear in the dust and the confusion, the aftermath. And if an executive can teeter on his perch all day long from dawn to dusk, a wren can say to him, Why don't you go on an organized outing? Stop fooling yourself. This world situation is a nonsense, though real politic may not be the accurate term for it either. So why explode like a time bomb that was set long ago and may no longer be operable? But you see, so many of us are like that bird, that man I mean, that for but a few can live resonant with anything like serious implications. So many were hung out to dry, or more accurately, to rot. And these marginalia, what other word is there for them? Are the substance of the text by not allowed to fit in? One can proceed like a ghost along corridors and find that doors are closed to one, and then what good is being invisible? It all goes to show how our parents taught us many things, including the right one, that we should untie gently like a knotted shoelace, and then little expressions of relief occur in the whirls, and many things, incipient ones besides. Yet on the shoals of this time, everyone believes himself righteous and lost, that the view is only a way in all directions, and one must have a timepiece to unravel ramifications that in fact do not exist, but like a gold toothpick are merely on hand to see that they get talked about, and maybe some club will invite one of them to speak. It is an air strangely purged of magnolias and quicklime, and anyone can be called to take a seat. Best to enjoy it, not to turn up in the unwritten part as a miser or scavenger few would have taken seriously as a person. But just as many might have feared. We live in an age when terra opens like breadfruit and one must pick and choose. The seeds and proverbs just aren't that numerous. Everybody must vote. Everybody's vote must be accepted into the tilting radio tower that is collapsing in one's own best interest in one dark swoop of mingled horror and relaxed apprehension. To accomplish anything more would be a joke. Yet the boy still stands there, hasn't gone away. By any other standards of misadventure, yet one is going to be firm and tame and positive in searching out the old prescriptions, scratching one's first initial idly in the wood of the door, and only then going away. To be something else in some other town when newspapers bearing that day's date finally arrive, and the citizenry perplexed still go about its business carrying news of new situations into inaccessible corners of this bland and stultified universe, only to be someone isn't their top priority going to be tall in late afternoon is the arrogance of these people anyone who's been around understands and that includes most of us barristers Out of one's loneliness, it's hard not to forgive the girl who longs to be seen and the guy who wishes only to be left alone. Forest dithers protect us a lot of the time, but for those moments when one is thrust willy-nilly into the spotlight, then, oh dear, I wish I had something more sizable to say, couldn't my part be rewritten? But that's over too long before, and the forest comes to seem more like a commodity, somewhere one can live and tie rope around oneself. The annals, if they are any, transform this into glamour and chrysophrase, two adjacent keys of a piano pressed down one after the other, and one's modesty, well, it's all here in the manila folder. I was going to talk about that, tree of the deep, tree of being beautiful of, of lost promise and hopes that still flutter in the distance, and you know, somehow... But in the end, it got mistreated. The happy moments streaked with sadness, but perhaps they always were. Perhaps it says a great deal that there were any, and so out of time with the rest that was going on, like a canary in a zoo. And I said, why give any guarantees if it can be rescinded without notice, if entreaties are to become comments? And you know what he said. He said, well, it's reasonable for you to expect that, but it's not unreasonable for anyone else to pay it no mind. So there... I was crushed. The one person I thought understood.
but it's all right. He can go on paying. Meanwhile, I am scarcely alone, though it is lonesome. However, when I start feeling blue, I can just step up like everyone else and lay my cards on the table. Look, it says so. It's all here, written in this book. So I'm never completely at a loss, only a little disconcerted, thrashing about sometimes. In the rival cesspool of other nations, they may think they have it better, but I know that here the uncertainty is pure. And so I often take the afternoon off, read, write, or gaze intently out the window for long periods of time. And then you take tea in the afternoon. That is, you make it and then drink it. Oh, I'm so sorry, golly, how never ever really comes to fruition. But by the same token, I am relieved of manifold responsibilities, am allowed to delegate authority, and before I know it, my mood is changed like a torn circus poster that became a pristine again in reverse cinematography. And these moments, of course, matter and fall by the wayside in a positive scene. Perplexed by myopia, one still enjoys it, and in the autumn of life crackles somewhere unrestrainedly before writing off one's accurate perception of all that has gone before in the heroic period when books are friends. Nature wants you to do it, no sizem infinitesimal enough not to register in the growing tornado of disapproval when mountain crash and the rubble, electricity bisects the sky, and shrill ululations burst forth from caverns deep in the earth's surface. But I'm getting ahead of my story. We're talking about how you, a wanderer, like it and how to escape. Oh, my dear, I've tried that. But if it interests you, you can browse through this catalog and, who knows, perhaps come up with a solution that will apply to your complicated case just conceivably, or perhaps you know someone better informed in the higher echelons where the view is distant and severe, the ground blue as steel.